forward. All right. Welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today and for bearing with us on rescheduling from the original uh, planned time. Welcome to the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education's Zoom platform. We are so grateful to have you all here today for our curator talk about Leonard Baskin, the Great Birdman. Uh, before we dive into the exhibition, I'll just share a little bit more about the museum. Um, this museum explores the legacy of the Jewish experience in Oregon, teaches the enduring and universal relevance of the Holocaust, and provides opportunities for intercultural conversations. We have a robust programming schedule. Uh, we have, uh, including curator and docent-led tours of our exhibitions, and next week actually will be the return of the Portland Jewish Film Festival, so I hope to see you all there. Um, and I want to just share as well that we are offering one last docent-led tour of Leonard Baskin, The Great Birdman. That's going to be here at the museum um, on Wednesday, January 17th at 1 p.m. If you'd like to learn more about what we've got going on, I'm going to drop a link in the chat about more of our events. Um, and then I'm going to share as well a little bit more about our two curators, and then I'm going to hand it over to them. So Leonard Baskin, The Great Birdman, features more than 70 works from the collection of Judith Baskin and Warren Ginsburg. Judith, um, who is the Philip H. Knight Professor of Humanities Emerita at the University of Oregon, is also Leonard Baskin's niece. She co-curated this exhibition along with Kenneth Helfand, Philip H. Knight Professor of Landscape Architecture Emeritus at the University of Oregon as well. Kenny and Judith, I'm gonna turn it over to you both now. Okay, thank you, Nike. So um, I'm delighted to be here um, with you today. How did this collection come about? Well, all collections are kind of eclectic as much products of chance as of choice. And certainly this is the case here. Um, this is a family assemblage and its contents have come to my husband, Warren, and to me often piece by piece over many years. Leonard Baskin was my father's, my late father's younger brother and he was immensely generous. He always was amenable to helping family uh, and friends celebrate life cycle events, creating wedding and bar and bat mitzvah invitations, birth announcements. Uh, often in his beautiful Hebrew calligraphy. And really from the time I was in my late teens, whenever I would visit, he would, or often when I would visit, he would give me um, particular pieces. Even as a kid, when we visited him in Maine, um, he gave me several pieces. But most of the pieces in our collection came through family members, my paternal grandparents, Leonard's parents, my paternal grandmother, and particularly my uh, late parents, Rabbi Bernard and Marjorie Schatz Baskin. Um, and so over the years, we've accumulated, in addition to a range of prints, also books and ephemera, four pieces of sculpture, and a number of unique works, that is works that are um, pen and ink or pastel um, or watercolor. Um, and I just, um, and given his immense productivity, what we have does not represent every phase and theme of his oeuvre. Um, okay, and I just wanted to say a little bit about his biography. Um, he was born in New Brunswick, New Jersey in 1922, the second child of Rabbi Samuel and May Gus Baskin. Um, in Leonard's early childhood, the family moved to Brooklyn, New York uh, Williamsburg, where his father was the rabbi of a large um, Orthodox synagogue. Leonard attended Yale before serving in the U.S. Navy in World War II, and he finished his undergraduate degree at the New School for Social Research in New York City. In the early 50s, he studied in Paris and Florence, and his art expressed in sculpture and painting and the printing techniques of lithography Wood engraving and woodcut, etching and engraving has multiple sources of inspiration. And I'll talk more about that um, in a little while. Um, beyond his deep Jewish, uh, his immersion in Jewish texts, other important influences included monumental Egyptian and Mesopotamian sculpture, classical Greek literature, as well as images of Native Americans. And he was also a 
an impassioned bibliophile, amassing an impressive library and a rich collection of engravings and etchings created by the many artists he admired. He always was a representational artist, which set him apart from most of the artists of his generation. And his images in every media confirmed his deep engagement with the natural world of birds, animals, insects, and plants. But it most significant in his art is the commitment to the human figure and its fate in a world of turmoil and suffering. He said, I term myself a moral realist. Man and his condition have been the totality of my artistic concern. <laughs> Uh, the two pictures you're looking at here are two of his self-portraits. And in a lot of the images you're going to see, uh, not only his self-portraits, others, you'll see his face represented in many, many ways. And uh, he, Baskin was, in fact, a, a master printmaker in virtually all printmaking mediums, uh, woodcuts, wood engravings, lithography, uh, and also, even though he considered himself first and primarily a sculptor. This is just an image here of wood, wood engraving. I won't go into any detail, but it's an incredibly tedious and detailed and, and exacting uh, form of printmaking. But what you notice here, if you look at the letters there, uh, he also did was a master of calligraphy in both English uh, and in Hebrew. But if you're printing, you have to, in fact, etch that or carve that backwards. Uh, and he did that uh, remarkably well. Okay. The Yom Kippur Angel, which is kind of the emblem of this exhibit, uh, he created in 1978. Um, and it, it's quite a massive piece and quite interesting. And, and you might, and it also indicates his interest in human beings as a, a human being as a winged creature, which we see in his bird men, but also in his angels. And, you might ask, what does an angel have to do with Yom Kippur? But we should remember that the liturgy of Yom Kippur um, and the requirements to abstain from food, sexual activity, food and drink, sexual activity, and other physical pleasures, such as bathing, anointing one's body with oil, wearing leather shoes, all reflect the sense that one is transformed on this day. In some sense, one becomes angelic, purified from the transgressions of the previous year, starting anew with a clean slate. So this image of a kind of, it's an ambiguous image. It's certainly a male figure with a mustache and beard and a male chest, but yet it seems to be a male without genitalia, if you look down. Um, so. It is a male, but a human being transfigured beyond human needs um, into angelic form um, as fitting for the holiday. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to briefly take you through the exhibit the way it, it, it's laid out, and we won't describe every picture that's available in the exhibit. But if you entered it after that Yom Kippur angel image, you'd pass through this uh, this passageway and on the right side, which Judy will describe in, in, in a second, are all works of Jewish themes. On the opposite wall, which we'll get to soon, are images of winged creatures and angels. And these were intentionally placed opposite each other. And then you see a little uh, opening there to uh, uh, an area, which we'll talk about later, of a series of portraits and then family works and printed works. Uh, so first, looking briefly at the Judaic, the wall of Judaica, which you see here. Um, and Judy will describe some of these individuals in a little more detail. Okay, uh, so here we see the sacrifice of Isaac, which was a continuing motif, a theme in his work. Interestingly, Abraham and Isaac become one human figure, perhaps youth and old age. We see the wings of the angel. The Hebrew says, Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac. As we know, Isaac was not ultimately sacrificed. An angel appeared um, with the ram for the sacrifice. Uh, this is a unique piece in that it's pen and ink. Uh, he gave it to my father 
um, fascinating piece. It shows the face of Moses, um, but also within the face is the site of the burning bush, the place where Moses has his revelation where God says, I am who I am, and you are standing on holy ground. And the Hebrew, the calligraphy above surrounding Moses's eyes is the passage from Exodus um, about the burning bush. Uh, Tobias and the angel. Leonard always liked things that were obscure. He liked having uh, esoteric knowledge. This is a wood engraving from 1958. It depicts the main figures from an apocryphal book, the book of Tobit concerning Israelites exiled and exiled in Assyria. It's about a man named Tobit who was blind, his son Tobias, a young woman named Sarah and a lovelorn demon who kills Sarah's husbands on their wedding night. Tobias is sent on a journey by his father accompanied by the healing angel Raphael disguised as a guide and a dog. And when Tobias catches a fish in the Tigris River, Raphael tells him that the various of the fish's organs can not only exercise demons, but also cure blindness. Through, through prayer and the efficacy of the fish, the demon is driven out, Tobias and Sarah marry and Tobit's blindness is cured. Ah, Judith, um, my namesake. Um, we always say the head of Holofernes looks like my husband, Warren. That may or may not be true. Uh, a lithograph from 1975, also from the Apocrypha. Um, Judith, like the biblical figure Yael in Judges, is a female warrior who seduces with womanly wiles and soothing drinks, the uh, Syrian general Holofernes uh, and slays him on behalf of her people. Uh, this image, uh, Judith, is connected with the holiday of Hanukkah. This particular image is very similar to depictions of Perseus displaying the head of Medusa, but with a dramatic reversal of gender roles. <laughs> and here we have a monumental Rachel uh, the wife of uh, Jacob, the uh, second beloved wife, uh, the mother of Joseph and of Benjamin. Very monumental figure. I wonder always if she is perhaps sitting on the idols which she stole from her father's house and also crossing her fingers as she telling a lie. Um, very strong uh, figure, devious just like her devious father, Laban. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of Joseph, um, which was created for the Passover Haggadah, trial color proof from 1974. It appeared uh, in a deluxe version of the Passover Haggadah, published in 1884, 500 number of copies signed by the artist of Joseph. The image does not appear in the popular version of the Passover Haggadah, which we'll talk about more. And this was inscribed to by the artist for his brother, Bernard, um, my father. Okay, this is a very um, interesting picture. It was in my brother's room for uh, during our childhood. Um, always was fascinated. I always was fascinated by it. Um, it's the four men who entered paradise or pardes, a woodcut from 1958. It's surrealistic, really. It looks like, you know, um, what's his name? Who I'm thinking of, of course, just went blank on. Um, you know who does Dali? it? No. The uh, sleeping, the sleeping gypsy and the tiger at the Museum of Modern Art. Anyway, here we have Rousseau. The, Rousseau, yes, the mm -hmm. tiger. This, um, this comes from the rabbinic Midrash. Uh, it says the Arba'im Nichna Sula Pardes, the four who entered paradise. And uh, what does paradise refer to? It's a Persian word, comes into English as paradise. Many people think it refers to mysticism or esoteric study. It's four rabbis. Um, and according to the legend, Rabbi Akiva, 
was the only one who entered unchanged. This is Rabbi Akiba down. Well, I'm not sure. I think this is Rabbi Akiba here. One of the rabbis uh, who entered paradise went mad, probably this rabbi. One of the rabbis um, committed suicide, perhaps the one with the tiger. And the, cl the clean shaven man is Alicia Ben Abuya, who became an apostate and left Judaism. So Rabbi Akiva was the only one who entered in peace and departed in peace. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very haunting. Uh, and the hauntingness with the bird and the tiger and, and the owl. Yeah. Uh, his, yeah. Yeah. Actually, actually, it's an interesting transition piece to talking about um, his interest in the natural world as well as the human world. There's, there, there's three birds. There's one pecking on the head of one yeah. of the rabbis there. There's one flying over uh, the, the entire portrait and then the large beaks that you see there on the right. Um, and there's the whole wall dealing with his work of angels and winged creatures and these creatures which are really anthropomorphized, anthropomorphized birds or if you want, they're kind of, you know, bird men in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, and he did many, many of these and, and these are just some, some examples of those. And he was particularly fascinated by raptors, uh, by these group, these animals that live on carrion and waste. And he said, this is quoting him, he said, birds of prey flutter ominously through my oeuvre. Eagles, owls, crows, immense and tiny, these predacious creatures symbolize their human counterparts. They exist as allegory, metaphors, and symbols, acting mimetic roles in the broadest sense. And here, this one of crows, uh, he actually befriended, became very good friends of the poet Ted Hughes, as well as his, his wife, Sylvia Plath. She actually wrote a poem about him. Uh, and we'll see also uh, Baskin would go on to, to illustrate many books and particularly books of poetry of his friend Ted Hughes uh, and others. But they're particularly these kind of large images of, uh, of really people or birds or com some combination of them. And again, quoting Leonard Baskin, he said, for me, the owl represents the reality of a man's life the horror, the rat race, the joy, the wonder, a kind of universal symbol, a simple one, indeed for carrying so vast bar barrage of meaning, but one which is potent, and I think at times because of the close interaction of man and beast does represent an outer projection of man's world. Um, so he read through these, these creatures metaphorically and uh, and symbolically, this one to me always looks like these images of, you know, like a fat banker uh, in kind of, you know, you know being an overlord uh, over the, the uh, metropolitan world. But if you look at these also closely, is an incredible detail, exacting detail of claws, of feathers, of beaks. And he's incredibly knowledgeable uh, about these, these, um, these aspects, these physical aspects uh, of birds in, in the natural world. Um, he also wrote, he says, my work, a large part of it has thematically dealt with the duality of tyrant and the tyrannized, expropriator and expropriated, the powerful and the flayed victims of human oppression and power. So you have these images, which there's a grotesque man, there's a press bird with human aspects, really dealing with the, um, let's say, the kind of most difficult aspects uh, of, the, of the human experience and trying to present those in terms of these um, these images of these bird-like people or these, you know, the opposite of that. His <laughs> fascination with um, animals, though, were not just with birds. There's a, this, this, this uh, dog here is only about three, four inches long. When living in Worcester, Massachusetts, he became fascinated with the, the feral dogs in the neighborhood. And he did scores of little engravings of these dogs uh, and, and was fascinated by them. And you actually see these dogs in other pictures uh, that he did. But he was equally interested, not just in the, the uh, words of animal, the world of animals, but the worlds of plants. Uh, and similarly to the way the raptors, especially the crow and the owl became signatures or iconic creatures for him, signature really kind of personal anthem, medals in some ways, medallions. Uh, the same holds true for the plant world. And for him, that medallion was the, the, the pomegranate. Uh, and it's again an image you'd see over and over 
in, in much of his work. And he, as he was equally knowledgeable about the animal world, he was also equally knowledgeable about the plant world um, in terms of, of its botany, of knowing, knowing species and understanding them and doing extraordinarily accurate representations of things. As uh, Judith mentioned, he was a realist artist. Uh, he, an incredible attention to realism, whether it's the natural or the human world, both of which he uh, dramatically engaged with. And this image is a kind of nice combination of them, of the crow on top of a pomegranate and up, you know, kind of uprooted um, as a combination of those. And the rare image, he didn't often use color, uh, but when he did use color, he used it very exciting in very vibrant way, as you'll see in the, the next group of images here of Native Americans. Okay. And um, I just wanted also to share one quote on the Judaica side, because I think it also ties in with these Native American portraits. He wrote of his Jewish identity, being Jewish, the people of the book are intelligent and fine as a religious I, a believing atheist, proudly declare my Jewishness. It is to Yiddish that my spirit warms, to that heritage of persecution and sensual denial that Yiddish so richly expresses. Not religion, but religious texts, not beliefs or superstition, fear or malignant custom, but the literacy, artistic, cultural and human relics of that religion. No, I'll do it. Okay. So um, this ties in um, to these Native American portraits. Um, and if I can just... Right. Oh, thank you. Okay. In uh, 1968, he was commissioned to illustrate the guidebook for the National Park Service's Custer Battlefield. In the process, he became profoundly disillusioned by what had heretofore been described as a heroic event in American history. The battle between the US Army 7th Cavalry and the Lakota Cheyenne people. In 1991, the site was returned, I'm sorry, was renamed Little White Home, Battlefield National Monument, giving due respect to the Native Americans who fought and died there. Baskin came to see the treatment of Native Americans as a genocide comparable to the Shoah, the Holocaust of European Jewry, that was omnipresent in his thinking and in much of his art. He looked to photographs of Frank Reinhardt, lived between 1861 and 1928, and Edward S. Curtis, 1868 to 1952, as models for his prints, but he added bold coloration. He produced two suites of prints of tribal leaders and members in 1972 and 1993, 50 large lithographs in all, showing the dignity of these individuals and giving a human face to the battle. Uh, we see Chief Joseph um, on the left. He lived between 1840 and 1904, 1974 lithograph. The Pacific Northwest Nez Perce leader, Chief Joseph was widely admired as a warrior and peacemaker leader. Short Bull Sioux, 1845 to 1923, was an Oglala Lakota. He participated in the Battle of Little Bighorn. He spent his last days on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Um. <clears throat> Like many artists, he was doing fine arts prints, but also had a, a, a very active um, practice really as a graphic designer and illustrated. And this is just a, a small section of the many broadsides and posters that he did for a variety of institutions, the Long Wharf Theater, uh, which is in, uh, in New Haven, and then others that you see there on the right, which he illustrated again, the works of, of poets who became his friends. And the one on the far right is, uh, just the series of these little kind of natural, um, uh, have natural history of elements. Um, the book, the exhibit then is organized. You see this central little, uh, you know, space there. And inside this space 
is a series on one wall that you're looking at in a distance, a series of portraits, which I'll describe in a, in a second. On the opposite wall, uh, the press that Judith will describe, as well as things related more personally to his kind of family. So those are, you're seeing the series of portraits there on the left, and then this press and family work that you see here on the right. And he did portraits, and he said about portraits, um, which were particularly important to his thinking about work, he says, the making of artists' portraits is in part the declaration of homage, and in another larger part, the clutching into one's bosom of historical imperatives and exemplars in an infantile way, indulging in image-making as a magical rite, vainly trying to imbibe and inculcate into oneself the character, quality, and genius of the artist displayed. He had incredible knowledge of the art world, and particularly an incredible knowledge of printmakers um, and the variety of works that those individuals did. So someone like Hercules Segures, who I doubt whether many of us have heard of, uh, he, was, he uh, studied these individuals and in fact published a book, which we'll see uh, an image of in a few minutes, called Iconoglia, I can, I kind of, it's very hard to pronounce, which was a homage to 36 artists that he considered his old masters. And he, in this book, he describes them and their works um, and their significance for them. Uh, but he did artists that we, um, uh, that we know about or are familiar with Thoreau and we know what Thoreau looked like. And this is a rather good representation of Thoreau. The others are- Can he... I say about yeah, Thoreau? Sure. Yeah. When it came out, it caused a kind of a uproar because he looked like a hippie. It was around uh, 1967 or so. And I remember that the um, East Village mother had it on a cover and Thoreau is kind of a- a hippie icon, yeah. and I got the first day cover uh -huh. around then. <laughs> you could still yeah. use it as a five cent stamp if yeah, you get one. The yeah, right. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, one interesting thing about portraits is for someone from the let's say mid nineteenth century on, we know what they look like. Before that, we don't know what those individuals look like. So these are portraits based on his imagination and trying in the portrait. What a portrait just does is to try and sh show something about what they understand. The artist understands that the character of that individual, or in this instance, the character of a character from a play. Um, this is one of, in the far distance there, is one of the rare, interest, rare instances where he showed a landscape. And this was the landscape of the city of Worcester, where he lived in the late 50s. Um, and then this view of, of really personalities within the city of Worcester. And again, you see these dogs uh, here in the foreground and it's kind of interest that he had in them. In the exhibit, we also, there's a case which shows a very, very small collection of books either about him or more often by him. Um, and the central one is one that I think many of you know, know is a Passover Haggadah, um, which is known commonly as the Baskin Haggadah. Uh, and if you've, if you've used it at Haggadah, you can just know you flip through it and it's page after page of illustrations of the Seder, of the story of the Haggadah, um, in fact, that was the best selling, besides maybe the um, Manashevitz Haggadah, <laughs> of sold over a million copies. But the other works you see here are others covers of books, including one by my colleague Judith there that you see in the, the, the lower left hand corner, um, and others. One is the catalog resume of his uh, prints from Gehenna Press, which Judah will, will describe in a moment. And then there's that book uh, that I mentioned earlier of his portraits of the old masters. And then the little one you see in the lower right-hand corner is an edition of The Old Man and the Sea. What's critical about it is it's an edition that is entirely in Yiddish, um, which is kind of ra rather wonderful, I think. And there's that, that image of the Haggadah. And again here, if you look close, there's pomegranates everywhere. <laughs> and there's a, the, the frontispiece of, of that work. If you get this work, there's not only portraits, there's pages of actually uh, art historical references that he did, learning about these printmakers uh, and how they operated in terms of their craft uh, and in terms of their sensibility in the term, uh, largely in the early 19th century uh, of what they were doing. And there are many examples of these. There's a few in the show 
uh, you could go online and just look up Leonard Baskin. You'll see many, many examples of these, you know, like the artist uh, Courbet here, uh, Ribot, who was a historical figure, uh, the cover of Judas book on Mitrotic women. And should I yeah, say, sure. uh, the image is from the Haggadah. So many of you are probably familiar with it. It's in the game at the end of the Seder, who knows one. And this is who knows four, four are the matriarchs. The uh -huh. right. And going up from the bottom, Sarah, Sarah. Rebecca, Rivka, Leah, and, mm -hmm. and Rachel. Yeah. Rachel. Yeah. And um, on a number, not a number, but on several of the books that I've been involved with, I've used uh, Baskin um, images for the covers or included basket work, Baskin works um, in the contents. The most recent was a book from Wayne State that was kind of done in my honor, essays about yes. the history of Jewish women. And in there, we have the image of Ruth and Naomi yes. from the five scrolls. Yes. Yeah. Judas is lucky enough, being a Judaic scholar, to use his work. Being a landscape scholar, oh. I have less, uh, I admire his work tremendously. I should add as a personal note, um, I first encountered all this work in Judith's house uh, many years ago when she moved here and I was bowled over. Uh, and largely because I knew Baskin's work since I studied printmaking at Brandeis University with a man named Michael Mazur, who was in fact a student of Baskin's. So he's kind of familiar with this from detail. This is in, in the, that old man of the sea image here of, um, of Hemingway, which also looks, frankly, yeah. a lot like Leonard Baskin like as well. Yeah. So it says, "Der Alter und der Jung." <laughs> That's <big. laughs> yeah, and and, and is um you know from this, I found out about it because I saw I think an ad on on an internet site offering copies for sale, and I bought twenty. <laughs> I think they were a dollar each, yep. and it's from the fifties, published by a Yiddish press. It's, it's rather beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it's wonderful. I gave one to Kenny. Thank you. I have it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, that last world deals with um, particularly the Gehenna Press, and Judith will describe that now. Okay. So Leonard wrote, One fair day I chanced upon the shelves laden with books by and about William Blake. Confronting Blake, plain and unexpected, was like being struck by a locomotive. Here was the model, praxis, paradigm, and example, an artist and poet coupled. He made his own strange and marvelous books. Their impact was overwhelming, and I determined to learn to print. He very much loved and admired the work of William Blake and was inspired by Blake's combination of words and images. And in 1942, while still 20 years old, while still a student at Yale, he founded the Gehenna Press, Gehenna Press, one of the country's first fine art presses. Uh, and Gehenna is Hebrew for hell. A line from Milton's Paradise Lost inspired the title and Black Gehenna called the type of hell. Um, he knew nothing about printing, but he would go on to learn and teach others with an obsessive attention to the complex artistry of combining words and images. He's included the domain of typographical variation, qualities of paper, binding techniques, and employing his extensive archive of images complemented by his own calligraphy. Um, he did not operate alone, but worked with skilled printers who became part of the staff of the Gehenna Press and this practice had a seminal influence on other book artists. The press published Baskin's own work, but also that of writers such as Shakespeare and Euripides, Robert Burns, Hart Crane, William Morris, and Walt Whitman, as well as contemporary artists and authors such as James Baldwin, Stanley Kunitz, Archibald MacLeish, Ben Sean, and his good friend and collaborator, um, Ted Hughes. And the Gehenna Press books are noted for their beautiful paper, their um, beautiful printing, um, as well as their wonderful choice of content. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Leonard was very generous to his family and friends in terms of um, creating invitations, birth announcements, et cetera. And here we see a collection of such um, announcements on the left are two New Year's cards from the 1950s. 
uh, saying Shana Tova. Uh, the green, uh, okay, we'll see that in a minute. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. But the green frame piece is my wedding invitation uh, from 1973 with a quote from the Song of Songs and uh, the blossoms appear on the earth uh, and the song of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Uh, on the right, um, our was a birth announcement uh, for one of his grandsons, Lucian Lehman Baskin, uh, 1998. Also, if we can go back to that page, uh, my son's bar mitzvah invitation from 19, uh, 1991, and then another birth announcement. At the very bottom, it's very hard to see, unfortunately, mm -hmm. is the book plate he made for my father, which shows the a uh, Kabbalistic symbol of man at the center of the cosmos with the uh, ten sefirot or divine emanations. Um, yeah, here's one of the New Year's cards. He's, his first wife was named Esther and she collaborated with him um, on several books, Creatures of Darkness and the Poppy of uh, and Other Poisonous Plants. Very nice pomegranates again with the bird, 1955. Um, and I don't know what else we have coming up. No, that, no, That's no, it, I think. No, okay, no. and then and, uh, Kenny will talk about this yep. one. Um, he said about himself, he says, although it has been my prints which have won me all this praise, my real and profound concern is sculpture. And he did a series of monumental sculptures which are not in his collection because they're monumental. Uh, <laughs> but if you know, uh, well, we if, have if, three if you've been, they're not there. Yeah. They're... Um, is most famous, the work that probably people do know, if you visit the FDR Memorial, uh, there's a series of sculptures. And the last sculpture uh, is this large frieze of the funeral cortege uh, at FDR's burial. And Baskin worked with the landscape architect, uh, Leonard Halperin, as part of the design of this memorial. But in the show, there is a, a series of, and you're lucky to see these, a series of sculptural works. Um, and these are a few feet high. This is John Dunn in his winding cloth, which is essentially his burial, his burial cloth. And even I just, there's a picture, I took a picture there of just that face, which I think is, is rather poignant and, and, and dramatic. Um, and then there's one, not surprisingly, of a bird man. Um, and if you've seen the film, The Maltese Falcon, which I suspect <laughs> many of you had, this one looks just like a dead ringer for the Maltese Falcon. Uh, which there's the line in the film, it's you know, the stuff that dreams are made of. Um, and then there's one more wonderful image. It's a, a, a shield, uh, and, and I think appropriately a shield of Icarus. Uh, this, uh, this, this individual who flew, uh, this man, this child who flew too close to the sun. And then of course, then the heat of the sun uh, burned his wax wings and he fell to his death. Um, but it seems an appropriate image given his uh, fascination with these these flying creatures um, and saying something again, uh, again, about the human creation, uh, human condition. Uh, and then lastly, last year, I was in the Vatican and at the Vatican Museum, uh, Pope Paul, is that Pope Paul, I think it was? Yeah, um, the fourth. Pope Paul the first decided that the Vatican Museum needed works of contemporary religious art. So in the Vatican Museum, there are in fact four, but this is one that's visible, uh, four images by Baskin um, that are in the, the um, in that museum. And this is his really life-size image here uh, of Isaac that you see here, which takes you back obviously to his initial concern uh, with uh, Judaica. And, and I'll tell a story that Judith has mentioned several times in presentations, but I love it. Um, he wasn't able, Leonard, of course, was invited to Judith and Warren's wedding, but he couldn't attend because he was at the Vatican Museum when these works were uh, dedicated, um, which seemed to be a reasonable. And the New York Times said in describing the opening, mm -hmm. chatting with the Pope were American artists, Leonard Baskin and Jack Levine. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop the share now and... Uh, if there's a question, say from anyone in, in the chat, or I see chat things there, yeah. or 
directly, we will gladly uh, answer them. Well, we have two questions loaded up in the Q&A uh, box. I'm happy to read them out. Betsy asked, what's the title of the Plath poem? I think this was, she popped this in when you were talking about the illustrated poetry. It's called The Sculptor. Uh, and it is a, you, could, you could look it up online. I'm not going to, it's a kind of long poem. I'm not going to going to read it to you now, but it is based directly on, uh, they were friends, uh, both Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath, and she she wrote that uh, poem about him, which is, I think, rather wonderful. Yeah, we yeah. should say Leonard, after his time in Worcester, he was hired by Smith College hmm. as professor of art. And that was where he first met Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes, she came back. And then uh, years after Sylvia Plath, Death, Leonard and his family moved for a few years to the UK, to Devon, specifically to be near Hughes. They had they bought a house that was near where Ted Hughes lived in Devon. I, I can read you just a couple of little short paragraphs from the poem. It begins, to his house, the bodiless come to barter endlessly, vision, wisdom for bodies, palpable as his and weighty. Hands moving move priestlier, then priest's hands invoke no vain images of light and air, but sure stations in bronze, wood, stone. Um, and he carved in both, he carved in, he worked in clay, he carved in uh, wood, uh, he had things cast in bronze and brass and, and other metals, um, and did it, it initially a series of, um, of figures that were lying essentially almost like sarcophagi, kind of human figures kind of lying on the ground. One thing I, I note about the, the bird images is there's almost always standing upright, um, like like human figures, you know, you know, on the on their on their on their claws, but but standing upright, and very rarely an image of a bird in flight. You know, the kind of most distinguishing characteristic of a bird is not the way he's he's presenting them. And so on. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We have one other question from Hillary Russell. She says, Judith, I have a cousin who translates classic and modern books into Yiddish. Do you know how I can get a copy of the Hemingway book to give him? Um, the best thing would be to email me. I'll send you one. <laughs> <laughs> Judith, are you comfortable with me putting your email address in the chat? Sure. Okay. Out there at the U of O. So. Okay. Related to, to Yiddish books, um, in addition, um, uh, Baskin taught, he was part of the Smith faculty, but that's part of the five college system in central Massachusetts. So he also was teaching particularly at Hampshire College and UMass and students and Amherst and students from all of those institutions uh, took courses with him. And interestingly, at, at Hampshire College now is the National uh, the Yiddish uh, Historical Library and Center, which is collected, they hope to think actually every book ever published in Yiddish. And if you've not been there, I highly recommend it. It's an absolutely fascinating place. The building kind of loosely inspired by Polish wooden synagogues. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. We should talk there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have to um, say that even uh, after all these years of living with these pieces, working with Kenny, um, on this project, I've learned so much more, the research that I've done, and even um, was prompted to add to our own collection. And you can go online, and Batskin, I believe, is still quite underappreciated, and um, the pieces are they're available quite reasonably if you find um, something that uh, you really like. And we hope they'll go up often. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I learned, that, that to peep the artists, in addition to these great, uh, these great, what he called these great masters uh, of printmaking. Uh, he was not particularly enamored with contemporary art, uh, either abstract art or abstract expressionism. Uh, but there were two artists he, he did admire, a man named Rico Lebrun, who I was not familiar with before, but particularly the artist Ben Sean. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you know Sean's work, you'd see some great similarities uh, between the, both the style and method, and also another artist who was a great typographer. Uh, who both in English and in Hebrew uh, and illustrated books uh, as well. So they, they actually had much in, in common and also they're, they're very, very similar kind of backgrounds. Yes, and yeah. there's a piece in the show 
of a uh, painting or a work by Sean that Leonard um, did a, I guess a woodcut of that yeah. he um, he cut a woodcut of the Sean work so a collaboration yeah. again in the early fifties. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions? Questions yeah. either live or in chat. I don't know if people are there. Yeah. I can't, we can't see anybody, so we don't know if there's hands or whatever. <laughs> no, no, no others, but Betsy, Betsy wanted to share that this show seems to have turned her into a Baskin collector of books before uh -huh. the show she had two, and now she has five, so that's great. Yeah, good. Um, and one of our attendees shared that they grew up in Worcester in the 1950s and studied at UMass when uh -huh. Leonard was teaching at Smith. Yeah. Uh, he also had, I mean, knowing people who had him as a teacher, he had a great reputation as a teacher in both in uh, fostering both the skills, the knowledge of skills in, in, in draw, drawing and printmaking, especially in woodcuts and, and etchings and so on, but also as, a, as an inspiration um, and, and an inspiration of how an artist works. I think people often think an artist just sits around and waits for inspiration and then something happens. Well, artists work uh, and he was an incredibly diligent worker uh, he daily working, daily drawing, daily, you know, etching or making woodcuts, and also incredibly prolific. He did hundreds and hundreds of works of, as you see, a kind of, you know, this is just a, a sampling, a, a critical and important sampling, but works that he did. Uh, and in the show, there's even some that he just kind of as a, a watercolor, and I should have shown where he was uh, with the family and he did a quick watercolor in here. You can have it. <laughs> so, or painted in um, some some engravings that were black and white. This was like two days before my daughter was born, September 1985. Yeah. He was at our house for dinner. I was very fortunate. My first job was at UMass at Amherst. And therefore, um, we got to spend a lot of time with them, um, with Leonard and his wife, Lisa, and um, the, the kids when they were mm -hmm. home. And um, therefore, I was able to be much closer to him than my um, then my siblings yeah. and um, also came into possession. Um, yeah, I just went upstairs and got my son's watercolors, you know, just kids' watercolors and a paintbrush. And, and he did both an original piece of my mon, a portrait of my monodies on the spot and painted in one of the flower um, etchings. Yeah. No, he, um, also, want to make sure we thank, I think, yeah. great, very grateful to the, the OJMCHE for having this exhibit. It seemed like a, a the building is kind of made for it, both in the, in its content and style. And so it's a, a great pleasure to, to have it there. And also it should uh, give some note to the, the exhibit designers, the Brian, Brian and Eldon Potter, who are the exhibit designers uh, for the museum, who really helped, uh, you know, create this and make the kind of space. And so people could enjoy this in, in the best possible way and in a very intimate way. These are works if you visit, you can get, you know, right up close to, you know, just and look at it in, in great detail. Uh, and the details are, are important. And I'd add just in learning, you know, I mean, um, it's, it was helpful to work with somebody who both had the, the personal knowledge of Leonard Baskin, but then also particularly in terms of the works of Judaica, of knowing about certainly parts of, uh, uh, of Jewish history and the Torah and, uh, and the Apocrypha that, Mm -hmm. Most of us uh, who aren't, you know, uh, don't have rabbis in the family uh, are less familiar with. <laughs> yeah, it's been a great privilege yeah. and a pleasure to yeah. work with you all. Yeah. And thank you all for your interest. It's been a joy to have the exhibition here. We've had a lot of really great conversations in the galleries. Our volunteer educators are um, sharing all of your wisdom with our visitors. And it's been a really well-received show. Just want to remind everybody that it closes January 28th, so please do come by um, if you haven't seen it yet, or come by again and see it with fresh perspective from Kenny and Judith's presentation. Uh, I think uh, with that, we can we can wrap this up. I don't see any more questions, um, but this recording will be posted to our YouTube page, and um, for those of you who had been trying to come on Wednesday, we're going to email this recording out as well so that um, if anybody missed it, they can definitely find it again. Okay, I'm gonna pause the recording.